I bet you've heard of these big names, or at least a few of them. Am I right? These names were carved into the stone facade of Columbia University's Butler Library for being the most influential figures in classical literature and philosophy. But not many people know that there has been a long history of protest against this facade of names. Well, the controversy didn't lie in the chiseled names themselves. Instead, the root of the activism turned out to be a structural issue that existed at Columbia, both in the university's exclusion of women from its core curriculum and the exclusive display of a homogeneous group of white male names physically carved on the walls of the Sanctuary of Epiphany of a prestigious university. More interestingly, 35 years after the first protest banner, the initial activism has evolved into a part of the university's culture, given a name the Butler Banner Project, collaborating with the university to enact actual, substantive change. Want to know more about the story behind the banners? Make sure you watch until the end. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Library Hunter. Let's take a walk inside Butler Library and see what it's like today. I visited Columbia University on a rainy November afternoon. The rain painted the campus streets with a glossy sheen, reflecting the glow of the neoclassical style library. The library is not open to the public, but if you are a researcher from other academic institutions, you can enter the building by going through the Library Information Office to get a visitor pass. Butler Library opened in 1934, replacing the grand but obsolete Low Memorial Library. It cost $4 million, which was quite substantial during the Depression era. It was funded by the philanthropist and alumnus Edward Harkness, who at the time was also funding the residential college system at Yale. The library was designed by James Gamble Rogers, who also was responsible for the Sterling Memorial Library at Yale. And yes, I went to visit Yale too. My tour video at the Sterling Library is coming up soon, so don't forget to subscribe now and stay tuned to see this stunning collegiate Gothic style library. Besides using the same architect as Sterling Library at Yale, there is another Yale connection, which is a massive clever mural by Eugene Savage of the Yale School of Fine Arts. This American artist, Savage, painted Athena into each of the college murals he designed, always adorned in the featured school's colors. In the Butler Library, Columbia's Athena towers over the center of the mural as we enter the library. The goddess of wisdom fends off green demonic figures representing ignorance and disorder. Below is a group symbolic of the working class seeking enlightenment, representing agriculture, industry, and intellectual endeavor. And if you look really carefully, you can find the skyline of Lower Manhattan behind the figure of Athene. In 1946, the library officially received the name Butler Library in honor of Nicholas Murray Butler, who had served as Columbia's president from 1902 to 1945. Interestingly, he had already put his stamp on the library as he had selected the names carved along the stone facade and panels which, as I briefly mentioned, has sparked significant controversies and debates over the years. Butler Library is the largest among the 25 libraries at Columbia University, housing collections in the humanities, history, government documents, social sciences, and so much more. And here's a fun fact. In 1934, Columbia had to move 22 miles of books from Lowe Library to the new Butler Library how did they do it? A giant slide. Pretty smart, aren't they? The Milstein Reading Rooms, situated around the building's periphery, mainly serve Columbia's undergraduates. Look at this book. It is a linguistic analysis of how these terms are used, the evolution of their meanings, and regional variations within New England. We can find maps 
showing the distribution of particular linguistic features, and learn the historical and social factors that have influenced language in the area. For example, in old-fashioned linguistics, the term teacher sometimes requires specifying the teacher's gender. While it can apply to both men and women, some informants use it only for women. This atlas provides a snapshot of language use in a particular region during a certain time period. I'm happy to find this in the Milstein Reading Room. It is a reliable reference of how language evolves and is influenced by social, cultural, and geographical factors. Milstein Reading Rooms offer interdisciplinary resources with a focus on history, humanities, and social sciences, supporting the curricula of the college, general studies, and, to some extent, the School of Engineering and Applied Science. The focal point of this reading room is the large stained glass window of Peter Stuyvesant, lit 24 seven. This space packs an extra punch of motivation. Peter stares down on the carols, reminding students that if they work hard enough, they too can be lit day and night forever. Besides the Milstein Reading Rooms, several other rooms are also open 24-7 during the fall and spring semesters. For example, the six group study rooms, the computer lab, and the lounge. Lockers are available through a lottery system to all students. The lucky winners will be assigned their individual lockers at the beginning of each academic year. Besides lockers, each floor of the library has payphones as well.
The main collection in Butler, about two million volumes, is located in the main stacks at the center core of the building. There are also several other collections in Butler around the periphery. Originally, Butler was a closed stack library in which books were paged by staff, and users were not allowed to retrieve books themselves. That explains why the design of Butler uses six floors to provide service, study, and staff areas wrapping around the central core of 15 vertical stacks. Nowadays, the stacks are open to all patrons. In this exhibit on the third floor, Global Displacement and Comics, a number of items are on display from the circulating comics collections, which tell a complex and multifaceted story of global human displacement, telling stories of human suffering, courage, and resilience. Many displaced people around the world have experienced significant hardships, and comics, known with their cleverness, immediacy, and acute grasp of current issues, emerge as the ideal medium to convey their stories. The Lawrence A. Ween Reference Room is opposite the circulation desk. The books in the reference room include language dictionaries, encyclopedias, indexes, and bibliographies. But you need to read them here because they cannot be checked out.
on the other side of the reading room, we can find more reference books, study areas, and the card catalog. The Columbia Card Catalog provides an historic record of materials in the library's collections up to the mid-1980s. Upon entering the second level of this reading room, I'm greeted by a serene atmosphere, filled with the soft, comforting scent of old books. The glow of lamplight casts a soft, inviting light across the shelves of books, bathing the space in a cozy mood. I especially enjoy the elegant spiral staircase. On the upper levels of the building, there are six research reading rooms. They support research in ancient and medieval studies, papyrology, epigraphy and paleography, African studies, Islamic studies, South Asian studies, and comparative literature and society. While I explored inside the library, I didn't notice that time was passing the regular hours of the Rare Book and Manuscript Library, located on the sixth floor of Butler. But just to share the information I found online with you, the range of collections in Columbia's Rare Book and Manuscript Library spans more than 4,000 years, 500,000 books, and 14 miles of letters, records, and manuscripts, including three noble fragments of Gutenberg's 42-line Bible. The oral history collection, unfortunately also closed on that day, is the oldest and largest university-based oral history program open to the public in the world. 
It contains taped and transcribed oral interviews covering leaders in many fields of history, politics, and culture. It's a shame to miss this amazing repository of human stories. All the library staff and students that I encountered in Butler Library were super friendly, and I had several pretty interesting and thought-provoking conversations with them during the last part of my tour. I was so focused on the conversations that I even forgot to record us walking through the Butler Building exit. In 1989, Laura Hotchkiss Brown and four other Columbia students displayed a 140-foot-long banner with the names of eight prominent female writers above the library's entrance during commencement night. They were soon stopped by campus security, who arrested them and removed the banner. After examining their motives, the university discovered that their intention was solely to address the lack of female representation in both the curriculum and on the library's facade, which predominantly featured male figures from Western culture. Good news was, the university soon decided to collaborate with Brown, they jointly released a letter urging students to realize that protest can yield fruitful results at Columbia. This is a significant step and one that should be recognized. In 1989, Brown seized the opportunity for university approval, leading to a complete redirection of the banner ever since. The two subsequent iterations were framed to promote critical inquiry, celebrate women, and provoke questions. For instance, in 2019, during the 100th anniversary of Columbia's core curriculum, a new banner with the names of female authors was displayed on the Butler facade, sparking a negotiation that persists today as the core continues to be revised and reimagined. The fact that Columbia faculty is recognizing their problem and making enormous efforts to balance historical impact and inclusiveness in their core curriculum has really helped to define Columbia as the institution it is today. When I exited Butler Library, the story still echoed in my mind. It was peaceful, with soft, leafy sounds in the wind and a sense of academic serenity. On that night of my visit, I truly felt that this campus is a place where you can ponder, dream, and find inspiration under the starry New York City sky. Meanwhile, I am curious to see how the campus feels during the day, so I might come back at another time to find out. If you have been to Columbia University, comment down below to let me know your story. I hope you enjoyed this video. This is Library Hunter. I'll see you in the next library. Bye.